If I had a hammer, I'd hammer in the morning, I'd hammer in the evening, all over this land. The Industrial Revolution transformed Britain and Yorkshire into the workshop of the world. Yorkshire coal, steel, wool and canals propelled the industry of Britain and beyond. But as with all history, there's two sides to every story, and for everyone who benefited from the Industrial Revolution, there were people who lost as well. And in this video, I'm going to be looking at the Yorkshire Luddites. So join me as we look at this part of Yorkshire's hidden history. Churches, battles, kings and queens, factories and big machines, castles, forts and in-betweens, the stories that are told. But first, we need to establish the context of the time. Before the Industrial Revolution, things weren't made in factories because, well, factories didn't exist. Everything was made on a rather small scale, in what's often called cottage industries because they'd literally operate out of people's houses. They'd use traditional methods like a spinning wheel. Yes, we really do own a replica spinning wheel. Well, just the wheel, the rest of it got woodworm and had to be thrown away, but I digress. But during the 18th century, a series of inventions transformed the manufacturing process. Now, I don't have time to go through all of the major ones because that would take me about 50 years, so I'm just going to pick out a few of them. One of them is this, the flying shuttle, invented in 1733 by John Kay. This revolutionised the weaving process, as it would zoom across a loom and do something which, to be honest, I don't actually understand, but it was really important, trust me. This is followed in 1764 by the invention of the spinning jenny by James Hargreaves, which again, revolutionises the weaving process. Unfortunately, I don't happen to have a copy, so here's a picture. Combine all these and other inventions together, and in 1771, you get the creation of the first ever modern factory by Richard Arkwright in Derbyshire. This changes everything. It's the first time that things can be produced en masse in a way that's a lot cheaper, efficient and quicker than these cottage industries and everyone wants in on it. Benjamin Gott produces the first ever wool factory in Leeds in 1792 and soon production and people are moving outside of their home industries into the factories. However, as expected, this threatened a lot of these cottage industries who felt that they could not compete with the machines. As early as 1779, weavers in Derby were threatening to smash the machines, although this came to nothing. However, things got worse. In 1785, Edmund Cartwright invented a power loom in which an unskilled boy could just stand there and produce three and a half pieces of material in the same time it took a trained, skilled weaver to produce one using traditional methods. They just could not compete. In 1811, the first proper insurrection took place in Nottinghamshire, led by the mythical Ned Ludd figure. He didn't actually exist, he was kind of like a Robin Hood figure who rallied people, but he nevertheless gave the people their names, the Luddites. Now, you might be wondering, where's Yorkshire in all of this? Well, I'm getting to that. By this point, wool mills had popped up all over Yorkshire, especially the West Riding, and in 1812 the movement finally reached Yorkshire. One of the most important groups of wool workers at the time were called croppers. They were quite highly paid compared to other wool workers, and that's because they had an important job. They had to basically finish off the wool by cutting and smoothing the surface, often using huge shears which required immense physical strength to operate, sometimes weighing over 40 pounds. Anyway, their job was becoming obsolete by the invention of a shearing machine. With this machine, an unskilled boy could produce the work of three croppers. Naturally, this upset them, and by March, the smashing of these machines, as well as other wool and weaving related machines, had become a regular and common occurrence in Yorkshire. A shipment of these machines is en route to Rawfold's mill near Huddersfield, when the croppers and other Luddites smash them. Now what's quite ironic is that these machines were built by a local blacksmith called Enoch Taylor and he also built the hammers which the Luddites used to smash them which gave rise to quite a famous motto Enoch made them and Enoch shall break them. The Luddite movement in Yorkshire reaches a climax in April 1812. A huge mob of workers from the local area, places like Halifax, Dewsbury, Batley, Morley, Brighouse, Heckmondwike, all the local centres of wool production, descend on Rawfold's Mill near Huddersfield to try and smash those cursed machines which had been putting them out of jobs. 
However, the local mill owner, William Cartwright, is anticipating this and he protects the mill with armed guards who manage to shoot and kill two Luddites before the rest flee, never having managed to gain entry into the mill. A week later, Cartwright survives an assassination attempt, but ten days later, another local mill owner isn't so lucky. William Horsfall is ambushed and assassinated in the street, and things reach such a crisis point with a fear of general riot that a thousand troops are sent to Huddersfield and the whole area is placed under military lockdown. In fact, it's estimated that across the whole country, about 12,000 soldiers were sent to deal with Luddites, which is actually more than the army of Wellington took to fight Napoleon in Spain the same year. Things had got so serious that in 1812 the government passed the Frame Breaking Act which made the smashing of machines punishable by death. This is despite the best protestations of perhaps the Act's most vocal and fierce opponent, the poet Lord Byron, who was also perhaps the most vocal defender of the Luddites. But nevertheless, in January 1813, three men are hanged for the assassination of Horsfall, with 17 others hanged for the attack on Rawfold Mill. 14 are sent to the colonies. The severity of these punishments is enough to deter any future potential Luddite, and the movement quickly dies down. So, how should we evaluate the Luddite movement then? Well, I must admit that I do actually feel a lot of sympathy for them. This was a time of radical social upheaval in Britain and thousands of workers who had spent their entire lives training and perfecting a particular craft were soon finding that they were becoming replaced and obsolete by these machines which could be operated by unskilled and untrained workers. That being said, I do think we should be careful to avoid romanticising the Luddites and mythologising them as some sort of Victorian heroes. But that's a warning that goes for all periods of history. Anyway, that's all I've got time for today. I hope you've enjoyed it and hope you've learnt something new.